Welcome to the Vet Me Rehabilitation Podcast, where we aim to help fellow Vet Me Rehab therapists increase their knowledge and elevate their practice. I'm Megan Kelly. And I'm Anae Lloyd. Together, we bring you the latest insights, research, and information in the field of veterinary rehabilitation. This podcast is brought to you by Online Pet Health, a leading continued education membership for veterinary rehabilitation therapists. With Online Pet Health, you will have access to a wide range of online resources to help you stay up to date with the latest techniques, advances, and trends in the industry. Our podcast features in-depth conversations with leading experts in veterinary rehabilitation. They share their own experiences and knowledge to help you improve your practice. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out in the field, our goal is to provide you with the tools and the insights you need to succeed. So join us as we explore the exciting world of vet knee rehabilitation and help you take your practice to the next level. Hey Vet Rehabbers, it's another one of my Behind the Vet Rehab Practice podcast today and I'm chatting with Natasha Paquette and her partner Tim from Rehab for Your Pet based in Ontario, Canada. Natasha and Tim share their story of transitioning from a mobile practice to opening a brick and mortar clinic. As 50-50 partners, they each bring unique strengths. Tim manages the back-end operations while Natasha focuses on the front-end. They recently welcomed a baby and thanks to the systems that they put in place and a strong team, they've been able to step away from practicing to enjoy some well-deserved time off. If you're looking for some free online learning, we've got you covered alongside our membership, which includes over 500 hours of vet rehab specific content for equine, small animals and hydrotherapy. We also offer free webinars through our limited access membership. The latest updates include core strengthening and lumbar sacral stenosis, what can we learn from human back pain by Andrea Henderson, what's new in hydrotherapy research from Ariel Pachette Markley, and managing the musculoskeletal health of the stabled horse by Gillian Sabor. Online Pet Health members, you can access all these webinars in your membership for non-members they're available at onlinepetshealth.com forward slash free a quick word from our sponsor nada first developed her courses at the colorado state university where she started the medical acupuncture for veterinarian certificate program in 1998 in so doing dr robinson developed a science-based platform for veterinary acupuncture the first of its kind today curical vet offers a comprehensive curriculum in integrative medicine with a rational evidence supported foundation courses include medical acupuncture photomedicine botanical medicine medical massage and integrative rehabilitation you can discover curical vet at curical Org. Right over to my chat with Natasha and Tim. Hey Natasha, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Natasha, for the listeners, won't you tell them how you got into the field of vet rehab? So I started off, I was a veterinary technician. I was mostly working in emergency night shifts and things like that. Um, as much as I loved working with animals, I knew that was my focus. They're just Something was off, something was missing. And during my time working as a veterinary technician, I was also competing at a high level for beach volleyball. So I always had that aspect behind me of like fitness, preventing injuries, staying at the top of my game. And I was just looking to see, oh, maybe I go back to school for maybe physio. But again, I wasn't ready to give up my dream of working with animals. And then I stumbled upon the program, the CCRP program offered by the University of Tennessee. And that's when I immediately, I didn't even know that existed. So that was like a dream come true for me. So I immediately enrolled, completed my studies. I did my internship um, and that is how it all began. And then trying to find places to do my internship, there was nowhere really in the area for me to do. So I had to travel five hours outside of town to be able to complete my hours and all that. Um, and that's how I just immediately found my space there. And that was really set for life for me from there on. And once you qualified, then did you go and work for somebody else or did you go straight into your own practice? Yeah, so I worked uh, for the clinic where I did my internship for a few months uh, before I, I wanted to get more hands on experience and all that before going on my own. So I did my internship and then I stuck with that team for quite a few months uh, before coming back home. And then that's where I decided to start my own clinic because there was nowhere for me to work at home, but I, and I didn't want to move away from home. <laughs> that's pretty much what inspired you just to see that happens a lot. It's like, this is where I want to live and I can't find a job. So let me just start my own business. <laughs> yeah, essentially. 
did you start with brick and mortar or did you go mobile first? I, we started off um, mobile, offering in-home services to a very limited capacity. Again, that was more testing the waters while we develop our business plan and see, uh, you know, as we build a bit of finances and build things, build relationships with vet around just to see even what what's kind of it's like in the area. Um, so our in-home services took off fairly well. Um, again, it was fairly new. Everyone's wondering, oh, well, who are you? We don't know you. But after word of mouth, that kind of grew. And then we were limited in capacity of what we can offer. So we decided to to jump ship fairly early and to establish into a, a building, a plaza that uh, we now expanded into over quite a few years. And how did you feel? Because I mean, it's always that time when you move from mobile to the brick and mortar. It's a little bit of a scary feeling. Like you're like, oh, we've got all these overheads suddenly. So just talk us through the emotions and, you know, the thought process that, that you went through. And did you feel like you had enough clients to be able to carry you? Um, at that time, I would say no. <laughs> it was definitely a big jump. We We knew based on our research, our market research, we knew there was a demand for it. Um, but coming in as a veterinary technician, not necessarily tied to any vet clinics, just on our own standalone, we weren't sure how that response would be. But we had done quite a bit of research to see and like the demand was there, but we can't say that we had built our clientele yet enough to feel confident in jumping in. Um, but it definitely rewarded us to take that leap because the, the clientele just built fairly quickly. Um, so the emotions were very excited at some days, other days, oh my gosh, what are we doing? Is, is this a bad idea? Are we, you know, going to lose all of our personal investment by going in here without knowing what kind of clientele we're going to build? Um, so it was emotional wise all over the place from greatest excitement to greatest fears all at once <laughs> so i think it's a good time to introduce tim now so when you're talking about we um natasha has a partner a 50 50 partner and her practice rehab for, for your pet um tim tell us about how it was for you because obviously you now have no background whatsoever in veterinary um what was it like you know investing 50 50 percent into a practice um, did you have some knowledge about the veterinary rehabilitation field? Were you confident when you went in or were there some sort of trepidations? So my background, I, I'm a bit of an entrepreneur and I think that's kind of what got me into this. Um, working mostly as a product designer for my, my career. Um, I've helped entrepreneurs. I've helped lots of people start businesses and sort of build products and that's, that's kind of what got me into it. And when Natasha was really looking for those opportunities, we together sort of saw that need within our, our own city here. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I originally was just going to provide some support financially. I was going to do a bit of branding, logo design, like bring in my design skills and sort of help on that side, do some planning, layout design of the clinic and that kind of thing. And that, that was very exciting for me because I'm using my skills that I know of how to use and applying it and, and trying to support Natasha in her endeavors. But I think at that time, we actually, we didn't really commit to this sort of 50-50. <laughs> and that came a little bit later as I really got invested into the business and got excited about the field. Similar yeah. to Natasha, I'm a bit of a, an athletic person and have lived my life going through physio, um, really taking care of myself. And that kind of drove me into the excitement and the, the sort of passion for this. Uh, so I think it was definitely scary in terms of providing funding and putting money to something that was new, uh, certainly for me, not being in the field. But with the research that I was able to do and really kind of seeing the opportunities and doing the market research and understanding the the potential. Uh, I think there was more excitement than there was sort of the fear factor. Yeah. It was, yeah, very sort of driven by that, that desire to, to really bring something new to the field, to the city here. Oh, that's awesome. And now you're seven years in actually. So, I mean, you've had the clinic for seven years, you've expanded it. 
Um, just tell us what your role is now. So as you said, it's sort of expanded into 50-50 and maybe you took on um, sort of um, more jobs than you, you'd originally decided you would. Um, so because you've actually got a day job, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I'm a professor at a university in town here, and um, that's a full-time role. Uh, I do a lot of work teaching and also on the research side of things, but in a different field in product design. Yeah, so mostly I spend my time, we kind of talk about like front end of the business and the back end of the business. So I spend most of my time on the back end of the business, dealing a lot with sort of the financial stuff. So I, I engage with our our. Uh, bookkeepers, our accountants, I deal with our lawyers. So dealing with things like policies, employment agreements, uh, a lot of sort of HR stuff, which again, is not necessarily what I know, but as an entrepreneur, uh, you kind of pick up these things, you learn how to deal with it and you, you partner with the right people to support you. So we've got a great sort of support network behind us. And that's kind of my role is just making sure that we're kind of keeping check on all of those business related things. Natasha helps a lot on this. We work together as 50, 50 partners, but the goal for me is to offload a lot of that kind of business stuff so that Natasha can really focus on tr treating our clients and supporting the team on the front end of the business. So yeah, mostly back end stuff is what I deal with. I love this dynamic because like as you're saying all those things I'm thinking to myself when I had my practice those are all the things I used to hate doing so Natasha you've got a good deal here right um so I mean these are the things that we used to used to put off you know I used to put off in my practice because it would always be the animals first and when I've got time for those things and then generally when you don't do them then things start to fall to pieces you know um so it's such a great dynamic to have because as vet rehab therapists you know our passion is in treating the animals and to be honest a lot of us don't really like the business side of things we sort of forced into business because you know like Natasha we want to live in a certain area and then you sort of have to have a business because you can't get employed and for a lot of people they don't really want a business so it's so it's so great to have a team that works so well together like this um, so that Natasha can focus on on treating treating the patients. So, who does the marketing? Is that um, a team effort? <laughs> I think that's a good team effort. I do a lot of the preliminary marketing, and Tim brings in his design work and says, "Oh no, you can't do that. We got to fix this and this." So I kind of do the buffer, and he perfects it. <laughs> did, Tim, did you design the logo? Yeah, again, it was a yeah. team effort, but uh, yeah. certainly spent a lot of time sort of iterating on different ideas. We we launched with a a pretty crude logo at the beginning, but we needed something to get started with the mobile practice that we talked about, uh, Natasha mentioned earlier. But when we got our facility at some point, we had to just establish a stronger brand. And um, it was actually inspired by our, our own dog, Duke. Uh, who's no longer with us, but um, a lot of the the iterations and the work that we were doing was really kind of basing it off of our boy Duke. Um, and there was definitely a team effort there. And that was something that Natasha was really strong about, that we needed to kind of capture him as part of it to, to bring in yeah. sort of the personal side of it, but to try to establish something that was iconic, contemporary, um, is it great, perfect? I don't know, but uh, we I think we're we've established a pretty nice brand identity and that it, it's been working for us so far but yeah it was definitely a team effort but I I kind of led the way in terms of bringing in that sort of skill set yeah I love it it's for those the listeners obviously you guys can't see it it's like a dog standing on is it a barrel or what is it um it was more it, kind of like a like a platform box type yeah, of, yeah, see of stretch. <laughs> is it a bull terrier it's a, a black lab a black lab, okay. A black lab mix, so he's not a uh, fully black lab, but okay. definitely Tim kind of traced around a picture of him, but then molded it to be a bit more, like you said, contemporary, modern. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really funky. Okay, so um, Natasha, do you want to tell the listeners about your practice? Um, let's let's start like how you started off, and then how you've expanded, and what it looks like today. Yeah, so as we mentioned, I started off just offering in-home, and at that time, I even had some dogs coming in. We lived in a 
building apartment dogs were coming to me um and then that was we started that maybe january and then we finally opened our facility october was our official launch but we were open a little bit before then so not too long like half a year of offering in homes before we finally step into this space um, we took quite a bit of time choosing the right space for us having worked at another facility helped me as well decide okay I really want this not this one key thing is I really wanted accessible parking lots so clients could have the pets easily come in and out limited amount of stairs so finding that prime location and we got really lucky um, so we started off with one unit in which we had one underwater treadmill, one treatment room, a reception area, and a bit of a gym space. Um, and then it was just the idea to start was just somewhere for me to work. We never thought about building a giant big team or anything like that. So started off as myself. Tim would come as the receptionist outside of his hours on Saturdays and things like that just to help out. It got to a point where... I was finding my, like people were calling too much. So I was at the front, but then I had clients at the back. So then it's like, oh, I can't answer the phone, but I, I don't know what to do. Um, so then we hired one assistant from there who was also certified in hydrotherapy. So that was really helpful. And then that made us grow even more. We suddenly had two practitioners now, an assistant. And now fast forward to a few years, we two years ago now, I think expanded. Three, I think. Three years now expanded. Uh, in the midst of a COVID lockdown, I don't know how it was, but here in Canada, we were in lockdown for almost two years, like no one could go out anywhere. Uh, so we survived that, which was great. So we told ourselves, well, if the business can survive this kind of crazy pause on life, then, you know, we'll take the leap. We expanded the unit next door to us. Actually, the, the tenant left. So it was an opportunity. We weren't necessarily ready, but the opportunity was there. So we kind of jumped on it, double their space from what we had. And now we are here today with a team of five practitioners, six, seven assistants, two chiropractors, an acupuncturist, um, a hydrotherapist and fitness certified. So some of our staff has grown with us in different roles, which is great. So definitely not at all the vision we had started off with and it grew to that, that extent. Yeah, that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And especially, you know, through the COVID time, you know, that's when you're expanding. I mean, it was a little, it was quite scary in those times, right? Yeah, exactly. Let's go back to when you first opened up the practice. Um, can you remember what your biggest challenges were? When I first opened the practice, my biggest challenge, it was a bit more on my end, a bit of insecurity coming in as a veterinary technician, offering, not knowing what you know, who would put trust in us to offer this care? How can we build this up with confidence type of thing? Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I think Tim was very helpful in in giving me that drive. I'm, you know, I'm not alone. I'm not just, you know, a little girl starting this big business outside in the big world on my own. So I had someone to kind of still drive me and get me the confidence we needed. So challenges were just getting that confidence to get out meet with veterinarians and, and just talk with them and realize that, you know, that not as scary as it looks once you just start having conversations with people. And, and I think Ottawa has been a really nice community that way. Everyone seems very supportive with all the same, you know, motive of helping the pet community in ways that, you know, we maybe didn't think were possible. So the, the response has been good. And that was one of my biggest fear and challenges starting off. How did you get most of your new clients in those beginning uh, days? At the very beginning, I'd say a lot of word, word to mouth because we hadn't done all that much marketing. We we had budgeted some, but really hadn't done much. So, you know, you start with one client and then one client talks about you and then the vets hear about you and then they reach out and we're inviting them to come meet us, come tour the facility. And a lot of the vets were really responsive to that. Uh, there's a few big events in the Ottawa area, like pet expositions, in which we would open up a booth. We did that for a few years. So again, people would come and reach out to us. We work strictly on a referral basis. So we only will take pets if a vet has referred to us. Um, so building that connection with the vets was really important. And that all mostly came from word of mouth. The clients talking to us, to the veterinarians, and then them reaching out and saying, oh, who are you? Like, and then us just exchanging with them in, in that sense and building relationships that way. 
And um, tell me now, the, the vets that are referring to you, um, do you have like certain number of practices that are referring and then others that don't? Or is it pretty much like if you've got buy-in for most of the vets in the area? I'd say pretty much most of the vets in the area. And, and like I said, the Ottawa community seems really good in the sense that even veterinarians that are offering rehab at their facility are more than happy to refer to us if it's for some reason more convenient for the client. So there's there hasn't been too much backlash or just, oh, no, we refuse to refer. Uh, we've had a few that we had, you know, to put a bit more effort in convincing them that we know what we're doing and just, you know, sell them on the service itself. Um, you know, we've had some over the years that maybe were a little hesitant and they seem to have turned the table, which is nice that when you see those referrals and you work so hard to get, uh, but at the end of the day too, sometimes you dwell on the one or two that are referring, but you see those 30 other clinics. So instead of focusing on those one or two, just see the bigger, all the others that are happy to refer and all that. So that's kind of where sometimes it's easy to put yourself down when the one's like, oh, we don't want to refer to you. Uh, but then we've built that relationship with other vet clinics, like I said, that have rehab. So if a vet's not willing to refer to us, I'm more than happy to point at least the clients that are calling into another direction so that they find the care they need rehab-wise. Yeah, that's great advice, just to focus on the positives. So when you started and you opened the clinic, you had no competitors. So is that still the case now or have other practices opened up around you? Uh, so when we opened, we were the first standalone facility. There was one or two clinics offering rehab kind of as a side service, not necessarily their mainstream focus. Um, and right now, it's definitely built up over the years. There's quite a few other veterinary clinics offering a lot more mobile uh, practitioners offering in-home services and things like that. So the the clinics around us competition has increased but that also just brings more awareness it's just something people seek more and more now they know it's actually a service that exists so in our sense we see the competition more as it's like marketing for all of us in the area that this service exists for people out there yeah that's great I mean, it's great that there's more awareness now of if you really yeah. take who you are and let's chat about your marketing now. So do you do any paid ads or anything like that? Or do you, are you sort of still working on your referrals and word of mouth? So as far as our rehab side of things, mostly just our referrals, the relationship we've built with our veterinarians has sustained us to a point that, you know, we've built even a wait list. So we don't try to market too much the rehab because we also don't want to make people wait too long. It's more, we're also trying to build our fitness and wellness side of things, preventative stuff. So that we're trying to market a bit more, uh, bring awareness to, you know, bringing the pets in before they're actually injured so, so that we can prevent them from needing the rehab they think of. Uh, so just fitness and general wellness is something we're trying to boost in the coming. That's our kind of marketing plan for the coming years for the business, boosting that side of the business. Nice. Nah, so, and I think that that's still an area which I don't think a lot of people have got into. I think we all want to, because obviously, um, as health practitioners, you know, prevention is obviously better than treating the patients. But it's quite a hard thing to convince pet owners to do, right? Um, so they're so used to just treating whatever the problem is or putting the fire out, right? Um, so yeah, how, how do you manage that? The current clients that you've got, so have they come to you or have they been clients that you've, you've had and they've maybe bringing their other dogs now so that the same thing doesn't happen to them? Tell us about, a bit about that. Yeah. So I'd say a bit of both. There's definitely, there's a good, um, amount of people in the area that do compete in agility and, and sporting dogs like that so who are looking for other ways to get their dogs fit and prep for competition so that's one area but not everyone is as dedicated as those you know competing athletes if you want um the other side we often have a lot of our clients once we start the underwater treadmill and they're like oh yeah my other dog at home would love this but he's not injured so i don't need you know we hope to not need you and that's why i tell them well that's when you should come like come even just for maintenance. And then we've developed some fitness packages for those uh, that are just coming for fun or introduction. And, and we tell people, if, if your dog's comfortable in the space, if he is to be injured at some point, this is family now, he's comfortable. The recovery will be that much better because he knows the process and all that. So a lot of people get sold on the idea from their injured pet to now wanting to not go through that all over again. And if there's any way they can prevent it, they're all for it. Um, I think a lot of people are also 
um we're we're me and tim are very active like campers hiking and all paddle boarding with our pets so we even bring our cat paddle boarding with us and a lot of people look to us and they say I don't know where I would even start to bring my dog camping. So we also want to bring that kind of lifestyle. And if we can offer tips and I, I see this dream of, you know, just offering webinars and things like that, or events that come, we'll show you how to paddleboard with your dog and things like that, just to be active in other ways than just playing with the ball for an hour and a half to tire your dog out. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And it's obviously, you know, really aligns with your values and your ethos and how you live your life. So that's awesome. Tell me, when you uh, expanded the clinic, I mean, obviously, because you had a space and did you put drywalls up or how, how did the internal structure work? Yeah, so the, the space we had originally, oddly enough, so there was us and the tenant next door that used to be one unit and the owners had, they had put up a wall to separate the unit and make it into two. So we had now removed that wall and make it back into one. Uh, okay. so we mostly opened up space and we've built a few treatment rooms so we have we have three treatment rooms two hydro rooms and the wide open gym space um and a staff room and reception area so we have uh, around 2000 square feet yeah like 2300 okay i always like to ask this question because i sort of see it very similar to when you build a house and you know you like your kitchen or whatever then you, when you design it you think this is going to be perfect you've got everything right and then you're like oh we should have done that oh we should have done that we didn't do that so yeah can you share any mistakes that you made in the design or in the refurb or whatever that you think oh gosh I wish I hadn't have done that so de definitely having expanded we we're able to kind of fix our original mistakes um going from there one that I can think of is hard to, without a visual, but if you come into our clinic, there's a bit of a a closet, if you want, that has all our laundry and everything, and the plumbing was all there. So we put a shower there, and then there's a reception area, and then you have to walk down the hall and to the hydro. So our thought was, oh, we can rinse off dogs if we need in the shower that's here in the front reception, but then you'd have to walk all the way back to finally get to your hydrotherapy. Yes. Um so we never ever used that shower. It ended up becoming a more janitor closet. a janitor closet more than, <laughs> and it's this beautiful shower that we've invested a lot, and it just holds our mops in our. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have showers directly in our hydrotherapy rooms that they walk in and walk out directly there. They don't have to cross the entire clinic with wet feet and, yeah. and all that. That was one one big one that uh, we learned, and, and now. At the time, we didn't have any floor drains. So I don't know if it's everyone's experience, but having an underwater treadmill, you're more likely to flood your place a few times, like just things that happen, you're filling it and you don't realize to shut off the water. So a few little accidents without floor drains that were not so fun. And now we have floor drains right next to our treadmill. So if there is flood, well, luckily it's not gonna flood the entire place. <laughs> Yeah, and I think you also underestimate how much water, even when you're not flooding the place, comes off the dog and every single dog that comes in, you just like, there's so much water there and you actually just need somewhere to sweep it into, right? Yeah. Um, so having a floor drain. Yeah, I also made that mistake when I made my practice. I didn't do that. But luckily I had an outside door. So we used to just sweep it outside <laughs> the door. <laughs> Oh, awesome if you could give any advice to somebody who was wanting to start their first brick and mortar practice what would that advice be my advice would be to kind of I'm I'm really the type to kind of jump in and, and let's go do it sometimes without even like I'm excited let's just do it um, so if you can find a partner that will Tim's the opposite he will just kind of plan things and never jump in. So if we can find someone that can help plan, but someone that can also push you to jump in. Um, so to not just dwell on your fears and take those risks once in a while, it really does pay off. Um, and fears, like I said, having a plan A, plan B, in case that doesn't work, you have something else to to jump on. So it keeps you at, at peace if something doesn't work. We have other options on the table, so we don't have to really fixate on the one one goal because we have other opportunities ahead of us. I love it. Plan. And what about for you, Tim? So for the back end of things, what advice would you give? Oh, uh, 
definitely uh, don't, especially coming from my sort of background and being sort of an entrepreneur, not necessarily coming from a business background, having that knowledge and the experience um, is to, again, find partners that can help you. So don't try to do it all yourself. Reach out, connect with the, the right people. Um, for example, at the beginning, when we started the business, we spent a lot of time at our local sort of innovation hub, where there's a lot of connections and support structures for connecting with, with business people, business consultants, uh, marketing people, anyone to talk to and provide guidance to you on business law, employment law, any of that kind of stuff that's really, really important. And you don't want to get it wrong. Um, so I think really kind of building those connections with the external partners. They don't necessarily have to be totally ingrained partners, but don't be afraid to reach out and talk to people. Sometimes we're afraid to like share our ideas <laughs> because we want to yeah. kind of own the intellectual property in a way. It's like, oh, yeah. it's all right. We don't want anyone to steal that. Or yeah. I think that's the, one of the worst mentalities to have is, is to try to keep everything so tight to you. The more you talk to people, and this comes down to market research too, and just engaging with your clients, potential clients, and really understanding what kind of services you can bring to the table. I think that's that's kind of the, the big advice is just don't stay in your own bubble. Don't try to do everything yourself and kind of reach out, talk to people and get advice where where needed and, and seek out sort of the professionals in those different uh, domains. I love that. And there are so many places that actually have those little business hubs, right? And business groups. Um, and it's not something that I ever did, actually, when I opened mine. So I love that advice. Yeah, great advice. So the last question is, what happens when you guys go on holiday? Who runs the practice? Because now both of you are not there. We we have uh, we won our clinic supervisor that we could not do anything without we would not have been able to have our child without her <laughs> being here supporting so she's uh if you can find we call it her name is andrea so if you can find an andrea we hope that everyone can find an andrea in their business that can support yeah. you from you know you can go to bed at night knowing that we're not there things are going to be fine <laughs> so when we go on holidays um, we know we have someone that's going to take over and if you build that team that's very open in communicating while we're away. If things go wrong, they're not afraid to reach out and we can, you know, manage things from a distance as well as needed. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, we do all need Andrea. Mine is called a mish. I've got a mish. <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> Awesome, guys. Thanks so much. It's been so wonderful chatting to you. And yeah, I'm so excited to watch your journey. Um, and yeah, what, what for the future? Is there plans to expand, maybe take another unit, another another venue, maybe franchise? We'd be more than open to expand. We need more practitioners. So if more people can come and want to work in Ottawa, we're all for it because the demand, the pets, they want the, the help they can get, but we just don't have enough workers. So if that's the plan is, if people want to come work, we're, we'd be happy to expand. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much for your time. It's been wonderful chatting to both of you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about all things vet rehab. A big thanks to our sponsor, Curacle Vet. Their sponsorship allows us to be able to give this podcast to you for free. So please go and check them out at curacle.org. Please also don't forget to bookmark the next Vet Rehab Summit. It's on Saturday, the 8th of November in 2025. Come and be a part of the world's largest online veterinary rehabilitation conference created specifically for you, the Vet Rehabber community. Online Pet Health members, you get VIP complimentary access to the Vet Rehab Summit. For more information about continuing education for vet rehabbers, you can go to onlinepetself.com.